on Miscavige's Life After Scientology. And that song is called Barnum and Gumbo. That's from my album that I did in 1974 in England. <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. And welcome to another episode of Life After Scientology. Fortunately, very fortunately, I have somebody back. We had a prior program on and uh, just running up against a time constraint. Uh, before I get into that, just let me do a little business, and that is this. We have a program called Patreon, and if you go to the website, therealonmiscavage.com, you can get there. And if you'd like to, you can contribute something uh, monetary to We don't have a sponsor, and quite frankly, I don't want one because I want this to be a program where people can come on and tell their story their entire story without any angles or uh, any lateral uh, purposes somebody may have to put into the thing. I won't throw you under the bus. I'll treat you with respect. And you can tell your whole story. And uh, if we had a sponsor, I'm afraid we'd have maybe to have to listen to something. Well, you can't do this or you can't do that. I don't want that. So if you'd like to, you can help by contributing and becoming a Patreon. You can do a dollar a month or two or five or a hundred, whatever you'd like, whatever it is, it will be appreciated. Okay. So with that out of the way, please welcome uh, an old friend of mine. And uh, I'd like him to continue on to where we were at on the last program. And this is Mark Headley. So good morning, Mark. Hey, Ron. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, that's it's my pleasure. Anyway, um, on the last show, I think we ended off with... Uh, uh, you were just getting into me being a musician and submitting things to David. And we we're at the end of the story at the flag land base and you getting busted and getting a new job. So we, could we, is that enough to jog your memory? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to say one thing was that, um, when I was on that post before I got in trouble, I was on the uh, quality control gold post. And um, I, one of the perks of that post, I was able to work out in that exercise building that you had set up for Dave. Oh, and, yeah. Um, there was uh, security guards, I think, uh, because I was in the executive division of gold, I was able to go in there. It's basically a handful of people that Dave was okay with using his building. And um, I didn't get to work out on his equipment. I got, I had to work out on the riffraff gear, but I still got to go in the building. And I remember that was one of the perks. But one of the things that opened me, opened my eyes up to, in addition to seeing you get kind of reamed out on the, when you guys submitted submission, music submissions or stuff that he didn't like, but even when there was like something going wrong in the building or one of the pieces of gear wasn't, in or hadn't come in or needed to be replaced and it was like they had you you were like on the hook like what why why is this happening why isn't this already sorted out and it sort of like opened up this other thing like yeah he this dude's not getting special treatment because he's dave's dad like it if anything it was because you were related to him you would get in trouble or you were even in more hot water because anything you did reflected badly upon him. So that's, that's very true. And I remember because I was talking to somebody and they and we, I was telling him about how we had met up or we went somewhere together and and they said, oh, that guy's got it easy. He's Dave's dad. He was probably cushier than any other. The other uh, I was like, you have no idea. It was so much worse for him than uh, than it was for just the regular people that were working there. I mean, the, the, the average Sea Org member at the end base had it better than you probably 99% of the time, just because they weren't related to Dave. Well, I think you're telling the truth there, buddy, because it was quite a disappointment to me that, uh, you know, not that I expected to be treated like uh, with kid gloves or anything, but yeah, I was held to a higher standard. So it was like yeah. any did, well, what are you trying to do? Sabotage what Dave is doing and you're bringing shame on him. Uh, you, you have a miscavige name. Hey, what is this? I'm the one who got all of us in this. What the hell are you talking about? But uh, I know. It, it was not a bed of roses by any means. Okay. And I, no. I and anyway. I, I how I, I felt about it. I felt, and this is just, 
cuckoo, but you get your mindset so that for the good of all, you should accept what is and just keep on going anyway. Don't yeah. complain and just keep the show on the road, whatever fucking show that was. In other words, it was to make money for uh, Scientology to build up this huge war chest that they have, but it had nothing to do with clearing the planet. And I'll tell you why it had nothing to do with it. L. Ron Hubbard said this back in the 50s, right? This is now 2018. So far, they haven't cleared an alley or a cul-de-sac. Now, no. telling me that that's the purpose, I say, hey, you better put your thinking cap on. If that's the stated purpose, that ain't happening. So what really is the purpose? And then you're going to yeah. get down into what their acquisition of wealth and real estate properties is really, that's really what they're doing. Yeah, totally. Anyway, so after I got busted off that uh, quality control post, um, I, did a, a, I did a lot of different posts. I was in manufacturing. I was in uh, the cine division, which produced all the films and videos for Scientology. Um, I was the producer. I was the assistant producer gold. Then I was the producer gold. Um, and then I ended up in 2004, I ended up being the systems manufacturing, uh, the division head over making all of their de department head over making all the systems, the audio visual systems for Scientology organizations all over the world. So all their film rooms, all their display, their uh, display systems, all the touch screens and all these sort of things all over the world. And it was on that post that I actually got the opportunity to go to a lot of these new organizations that were being opened. So at the base, you're sort of in a bubble where you're seeing video and you're seeing certain things that are happening and it's all being packaged and presented to the crew at the base like we're rock stars, we're saving the world. The yeah. things we're doing are resulting in billions and billions of people getting into Scientology. And that's right. not a joke. Billions with a B. That's how many people we think are getting into Scientology at the end base based on all the products that we're producing. Right. And, and also we're producing, we're producing thousands and thousands of items that are for sale to Scientologists. And then they're being shipped off, but we don't know what's happening with them. We don't know that they're if they're actually getting sold or are they sitting in a warehouse or so there's a little bit of disconnect. You see everything going out, but you don't see what happens with it. Right. So on this post, I got an opportunity to actually see some of these organizations and they were all ghost towns. One for one, every single organization that I went to, there was no one in it. There were no Scientologists there. There was very few staff there. The staff weren't getting paid. The staff didn't have money. The staff, it was all these things happening. And that was the reality of it. So wow. you're, you're at the base, you, you, you know what you know, but then when you see what's actually happening, it's sort of jarring. And, and that's when I sort of realized we're, we're, this is a giant waste of time. Like I'm slaving away 120 hours a week for nothing. Not, 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 not just a little result, zero results. There's nobody getting into Scientology. Mark, let me ask you a question. Just well, I, I'd say not to interrupt you, but of course I'm interrupting you. In all this, now you've done a round of tremendous amount of posts, right from the lowest to the highest. I mean, you had high executive positions. In all this time, did it ever occur to you that you should get out of there? That you should escape from this goddamn alternate reality? There was one time in 1990 when I first got there, and I got in trouble for some silly thing. And I thought, that's it, I'm out of here. And, uh, and I told them, I'm leaving, I'm done. And they gave me a leaving staff routing form. So you can't just walk out the door. You've got to now do all these steps to be able to leave properly. And, and Jackson, Gary Moorhead, he's, he was the security chief at the end base. And he told me, if you leave, you're never going to see your family again. You're going to get to declare it a suppressive person. You're going to have to pay a freeloader bill, all these things. And I thought, oh, geez. And, uh, and Greg Wilhair, for some reason, Greg Wilhair came around and he was in RTC and, uh, and he was actually running gold at the time. He was on a mission into gold. And he told me, you're not in trouble. This is nonsense. Go back to work. You're, nothing's going to happen to you. This is all fine. 
And so I kind of thought, okay, I'll stay. If I'm not, I don't want to have all that other craziness happen. And I don't want to not see my family ever again. And then, um, and so I ended up staying. And then shortly thereafter, I got married to Claire. And because I was married to her, I thought, well, oof, you know, maybe I'll, maybe things will get better. A lot of people at the base are always thinking it's so bad. Yeah. At least it can't, can't get worse. It can only get better. And, nice. and then, right. and, and inevitably it would get worse. It would always get worse. It never got better. And I even talked to, I, I left in 2004. I talked to somebody who left in 2010 and they were like, oh my God, you got out when it was, wasn't that bad. It got way worse. And I thought, how could it have gotten worse? Well, I have a theory and it's this. If things are going bad, they won't automatically start going good. They'll continue to go bad and get worse because those things that are making it go bad will remain in. And the sheer momentum of this carrying forth will make things get worse and worse and worse. And there's no end to how bad it can get as far as I'm yeah. concerned. And, uh, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I, I think also that you have the, you have the additional factor where when, when I was first there in 1990, there was almost a thousand people at the base. Yeah. There was a lot of people there. And they built those birthing buildings there to house 1,600 people. So if you've got a thousand people doing the jobs of 1,600 people, it's going to be horrible because those thousand people are, they're, they're overloaded. They just can't do that much work. Well, then you fast forward to now, there's like two, 300 people left. Yeah. So are they still supposed to do the work of 1600 people? I don't know. They've offloaded some stuff to Los Angeles to this new facility they've built, but they're still supposed to produce films and they're still supposed to be management. So you, you think, well, maybe they're, maybe they've offloaded a few hundred uh, people worth of work, but they still have maybe a thousand people, a thousand posts that need to be filled right. with 300 people to do that amount of work. And, 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 and also just the sheer fact that there was a thousand people there and now there's two, 300. So they got rid of 700 people that either escaped, they blew, they were SPs, they were how many, you know, L. Ron Hubbard says that, isn't it two and a half percent of the population are suppressives? Yeah. Like that's just a hard number. Like however you work it, no matter where you go, what's happening, two and a half percent of the people are suppressive and that's why they blow or that's why they get expelled. Well, you had a thousand people and you got 300 left. Uh, I don't know. I'm not, I didn't finish school. I don't know the math, but that, I think that's like 70%, not 2%, two and a half percent. Yeah, so either that or all the SPs join Scientology. <laughs> yeah. And I tell this to a lot of people when they ask me, well, you know, there's a lot of people in Scientology saying, no, no, listen to me. There's more ex Scientologists than there are current active Scientologists. That's yeah. a fact. More yeah. people have been in and said, this is crazy and gotten out than the amount of people that are actively going and partaking and doing courses or paying money for auditing or whatever. So there's something there that ain't right for that many people to have left. So no, you're right. So, but getting to the thing where the leaving. So once I saw these organizations and then there was some silly flap that happened where they said, oh, you're going to go to the RPF. And then I, and then I just thought about it. I thought, okay, so I'm going to get declared a suppressive person. Well, right now I'm being treated like I am a suppressive person. And there were actually people on the property that were declared suppressive persons that were part of international management. Like like Mark Yeager and Guillaume and yeah. Ray Minoff, these people had been declared suppressive persons and they were still running and doing the posts of running international management, doing things in Scientology. So I'm never going to see my family again. Okay. Well, I never do see my family because I haven't seen my mom in forever. I haven't seen my dad in forever. So I'm not, and also the not seeing your family again, when you join the Sea Org, you, you sign, you check that off your list right there. Like if yep. you have family outside of the Sea Org, you're pretty much not going to ever see them. And if you do see them, it's going to be for a few hours on a few days out of a few years. If, if you can get approval 
to leave the property and go do something that's considered chasing butterflies or you're just why why do you need to go see of why do you need to go to a funeral for somebody who's already dead what's the purpose of that there's no there's not that's not productive that's there's no use in doing that so so really i realized i'd rather be a bum or dead than to be at that property wow. that's literally i i i said i'm gonna take the chance and that's also another thing is when you do decide you're gonna leave if you do the route of getting out the way they want you to get out, they want you to confess that everything you did was horrible and you, you're a horrible person and they want you to do all these things the way they want you to do it. So then when you do leave, they can say, well, yeah, of course you left. You were a horrible person. We didn't want you here. That's why you left. Yeah. When you just try to escape and run out the door, they have this drill called the blow drill where they try to track you down. And so when I left, I left on a motorcycle and 10 seconds after I was driving away, I had a security truck following me down the road, trying to run me off the road to get me to come back. And, and luckily for me, they did run me off the road. Danny Dunnigan and Matt Butler were in the security truck. They had this black Nissan Pathfinder right. and they were driving along next to me on the, on the highway. And they said, come back, come back. I said, forget you. And they just, slowly just kept moving until I had nowhere left to drive. And then I crashed the bike on the side of the highway. And when they did that, somebody driving by saw. And that person called the police. They called 911. Wow. And that was the only thing that saved me and, and made it so I did actually get to escape because they had a police scanner and they heard the call go out that some guys were fighting on the side of the highway and it was a black SUV and a motorcycle. And when they heard the call go out, they left me and drove back to the property. Mm. And the bike and my bike was actually broken. The handlebar, the uh, clutch lever was broken off and, um, and the bike was a bit banged up and it was raining too. So it was muddy and my suitcases were in the middle of the road and I grabbed everything and I, I had to bump start the bike to get it to go again because um, I had no clutch and I was putting down the road at like five, <laughs> five miles an hour because wow. the carburetor was flooded and I couldn't, I had no acceleration anyway. And they pulled me over a sheriff, a Riverside sheriff's deputy pulled me over and said, Hey, what's up? What's up? Where are you going? And I'm still like in like fight or flight mode. Like don't cause any problems. Right. I just want to get out of here. I don't want to make trouble because I know if I make trouble, I'm going to get, it's going to get a million times worse. So I was just right. like, oh, nothing. I'm just going to see my dad. And these guys had a few questions for me before I left. Da, 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 da. And Muriel, Muriel Dufresne from the port captain office, she rolls up right next to us. The cop is sitting there right with me at the motorcycle asking me questions. And Muriel comes up and she goes, what's the matter with Mark? And as soon as she said that, he knew her. He's like, oh, that's the girl who works at Golden Era. Right. And, and he put the pieces together immediately. He was like, this dude's from Golden Era. He's trying to escape. They ran him off the road. Now she's coming to try and clean it up and get him to come back. And he just told her, nothing, just a routine traffic stop, ma'am. Just move along. And, um, and as soon as she drove off, he's like, where are you trying to get to? And I'm like, I'm trying to get to the U-Haul in Hemet. He's like, okay, good. Let's go. <laughs> it's like, it was like enough of all the of the facade. We know yeah. you're trying to escape. You know, you're trying to escape. Let's get you escaped. <laughs> That's and great. they, and they escorted me to the, uh, the U-Haul. It was actually, it was in San Jacinto, but, uh, in uh, San Jacinto. And then they waited there until I had my bike in the back of a truck and was driving and I was safe. It was two, wow. it was two, two deputies ended up helping me. And in fact, while they were escorting me to the U-Haul, at least two other vehicles tried to intercept and follow, follow us. And they had to pull those guys over. Wow. And, and I have the police reports of the thing. I think if you actually just Google Mark Headley police reports, the two Riverside Sheriff deputies that uh, helped me, um, they filed police reports and they, they redacted all the, the info, but I'm pretty sure it was Bruce Wagner who was in the port captain office. Yeah, he was the port and, captain. Or assistant to Muriel. Yeah, he was like, he was the legal director. Yeah. 
And it was him and Muriel that were trying to follow. <clears throat> and, and they had to pull them over and tell them, hey, you're in interfering with the police investigation. You know, get the hell out of here. And so when we got to the U-Haul, I was like, okay, thanks a lot. I appreciate you guys giving me an escort. They're like, no, no, I don't think so, buddy. Two cars try to intercept you with us escorting you. Like while two police cars were escorting you, they still had the balls to try and follow so we're yeah. going to stay here until you're in a truck and you're safely off to wherever you're going. Well, anyway, I'm, but then, Mark, th listen, Scientologists believe they're above the law. They think they're the superior race and they're the top 10% of the top 10% on the planet. And anybody who's a wog, which is a non-Scientologist, is beneath them. Their arrogance is astonishing. But I can see them trying to pull you over right in the face of cops riding right next to you. I oh yeah, that. didn't didn't even phase them in the slightest. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Anyway, so luckily, my the, luckily the police helped me. And then my dad ended up saying, "Yeah, you can come to Kansas City." I found a place where I could stick my bike, and uh, and he bought me a plane ticket. But even then, I didn't know if he would even want me to come be with him. Yeah, because I was so in that bubble that I didn't even know as that my dad would be like, yeah, of course you can, you're my son. You can come yeah. live with me. I had, my, my family dynamic viewpoint was just totally out of whack. Yep. And in fact, he was like, I've been waiting for this call for 15 years. Like, Jeez, right. like, yeah, of course you can come. I've absolutely come right now. And so then I lived in Kansas city. I managed to help Claire escape a few weeks later. Um, and that's a, that's a long story longer than we have here. And they intercepted her and Greg Wilhair told me they had captured her and we're bringing her back. And this has all gone into in my book, but, um, we ended up living in Kansas city and then got, we got jobs and we had a condo and, you know, I, we live with my dad for a few weeks and then we got our own place. And then we sort of started our own lives and everything that we had been told was nonsense. We, right. we were told that everyone in the, in the, they call them wogs. If you're not a Scientologist, they, it's a, they refer to you as a derogatory term, a wog. Everyone in the wog world is a criminal, a prostitute, a drug dealer. Yeah. Um, it's a horrible place to live and, and work. And you, you, you would, if you left the Sea Org, if you were at the best, at best, you'd end up flipping burgers at Burger King or something like that. And, um, and to tell you the truth, I would love to flip burgers at Burger King compared to work and live at that place. I would flip, I would, I would do it happily with enthusiasm. I would flip burgers at Burger King. That's not a bad thing to do. At least I'm making food for somebody to eat at that place. You're destroying families and stealing people's money. What, what, where's the pride in that? You know that there's, come on, Burger King ain't a bad deal. Um, but we ended up getting jobs and, you know, and they, and we and we just wanted to just do our thing and just not have anything to do with them. Yeah. We weren't. I wasn't trying to cause them any trouble. I just didn't want to be there anymore. Yeah. And then when Claire came, I was like, "Well, this is perfect. We can start a family. We can just live our lives and yeah. start over." Fine. Okay, fine. We wasted 15, 20 years, but we're going to start over and we're going to make the best of it. And I'll tell you, they did not want that. They could not be happy with us just being not there anymore. They had to cause trouble for us. And we ended up moving back to Los Angeles for some work opportunities that I had there. And, um, and they, they gave us a freeloader bill for $92,000. Jesus Christ. Now I haven't even read Dianetics. Okay. Yeah. I never, I never did any auditing really. The only Really, the only auditing I got was from Tom Cruise at the base. That was yeah. it. I didn't do OT levels or I didn't, none of that. I got a little bit of introductory auditing from Tom Cruise, and that was about it. And a lot of sec checking, a lot of interrogations on the e -meter. Yeah. And then, um, and I did the basic courses that everybody has to do. And I did car school so I could drive. And I did, uh, you know, the basic stuff. I didn't, I didn't do any grades or academy levels or none of that. I didn't do any of that. My wife was OT five or something like that. Yeah. So probably that 92 G's was a majority of her, probably 50, 60 of it. 
with stuff she did. Yeah. But they wanted $92,000 from us. And I thought to myself, you have got to be kidding me. Like, now that I'm in the real world, I know you guys have no authority to do anything. Like, yeah. you say I owe you $92,000. I say, no, I don't. That's it. We're done. No, that's the end of it. End of it. You're not going to, what are they going to, uh, what are they, when you uh, send a bill to the employer and they take a little bit of money out uh, of your pay to pay like a alimony or yeah. spousal support or child support? No, they don't. They can't do any of that. There's nothing they can do. They're yeah. never going to see that 92K. Anyway, but in order to become in good standing again in Scientology, you basically have to say that you were a criminal. That's why you left. You have to pay them the $92,000. And then you have to do about whatever other nonsense they want you to do in order yeah. for you to see your family and, 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 and all this again. So basically, because of that, I haven't seen my sister since the day I left. Wow. I haven't seen my brother. I have a half brother who lives in Florida. I haven't seen him once since I left. I've seen my mom on two occasions at funerals. And even then, it was very, very limited for maybe a, an hour or so. And even then... She had never met our kids wow. until, that, until she saw them at a funeral. And when we saw her, we didn't even introduce them to her as my mom. We just said, this is this, is this lady, Trudy. Like, because we knew we were never going to see her again. Right. And, and her family, her family has nothing to do with Scientology. Her entire family, no one has any Scientology dealings. And, um, and she told them when they said, hey, why don't you talk to Mark and Claire and the boys and all that? She said it would be risking all of mankind's future eternity if she spoke to us. Jesus Christ. She, you talk she about told this to her. Yeah, she told this to her non-Scientology family. They're like, this is Lewis a, and Mary Mouse. Oh, yeah, are you a God. space cadet or what? Anyway, so anyway, so we were declared suppressives, and that was the end of it. And then they started messing around and I mean, the stuff they did to us is the subject of another book. So the book I wrote, Blown for Good, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology, that really details the 15 years that I was there. And a lot of the things I've talked about today are gone into in great detail, all the different interactions with people. Yeah, and I, I got to say this. That's a fabulous book. I read it from cover to cover. And you, you talk oh, about it with a great memory. You got one, man, I'll tell you. I mean, the, it, the details it goes into, I know... Some people reading it may think, is this guy serious? Yes, he is. It's hard for a sentient being who lives in a real world where people are friends with each other, you have families, to consider some of these things have gone on. But they have. I, I tell you, I recommend your book 100%, Mark. And then awesome. the, again, say it again so that our audience gets it. It's blown for good behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology. And you yeah. can get it on Amazon, iTunes. It's a, a just a re, we just released the Audible version of it this last few weeks, so you can get it on uh, Audible or Amazon Audiobooks or iTunes. Um, you can also go to blownforgood.com, and we have signed uh, paperback and hardback copies we sell there. And buy a copy today. Um, buy a copy. You won't You'll love it. it. Yeah, you will. It's not. a good book. I, I, I'm not a writer, and I didn't finish school, but most people that I've talked to have read it. Said it's good. And it. The stories along, uh, uh, alone carry it, and you can, if you can get through the fact that I, I never uh, became a writer or learned to you know, properly write, you, you can still, you'll get the story. You'll get the gist of it. Don't worry about that part. Mark, you're a storyteller, and that's more important than being just someone you call a writer because yeah. the story is a true story, and it carries you through a, an, an unbelievable experience of a young man coming out the other end and being, right now, you're successful at your business. And maybe at the end of this, you can tell us what you do. Sure. But let's continue on with your story right now. Anyway, so the next book I'm writing talks about all the things they did to us after we left. And in some cases, the stuff they did after we left is worse than the stuff that happened to us when, when we were there. Like an anonymous person called child services to try and get our kids taken away from us. Um, they, they tapped our phones. In 2011, two years after I wrote the book and the, released the book, I was able to get my dossier from the Office of Special Affairs. So I actually got a file with all of the correspondence of all their surveillance that they were doing on us, back and forth communiques from 
OSA to RTC and back. They had a lawsuit that they'd drawn up to try and sue me. Pages and pages and pages of my phone records. Who I called, the number, and the duration of the call. Wow. And I don't know how you get those without having somebody at the phone company who gives you those. Uh, or unless they tapped our phones or, or whoever, however they did it, they gained these, this information by illegal means. Yeah. And, um, and so, and, and, and all sorts of other things, private investigators following us, going to the store, following us, the kids' schools, you name it. And so where I was just content to just leave and do my own thing. And they do this with a ton of people. You think this guy left, let them leave. Nope. They can't do it. They got to mess with people and they got to interfere with their life and they got to keep tabs on them and they got to do this stuff. And in a lot of cases, people that you've heard from would have, you would have probably never heard from ever again. They would have just went off and lived their lives. Yeah. But Scientology had to mess with them and harass them after they left. Yeah. Like I'm gone. Why, why bother with me? I don't work for you. I'm not part of your thing. I'm not even talking smack about you. I just want to live my life. And then they mess with the person and then it's like, okay, you're going to mess with me. Okay, great. I'll just tell my story then. I'll tell you, I'll tell you everything I know. Yep. If you want to do this game, I'll play. Let's go. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go. And one of the things that I, I did when my book came out was I did these radio shows and you know, there was this one show at the base. The base is in the middle of the desert. Really? It's, it's two hours from Los Angeles, right? But there was a radio station that I could always get. And it was an AM station. It was called KFI AM 640. And I could always get that station at the base on my AM radio. The signal was strong enough that I could always get it. And I listened to some of these radio shows at night. And I thought, you know what? It's a stretch. But I'm, my book's out. This is 2009, 2010 maybe. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to do a show on that KFI station. And if anybody at the base is hearing KFI, they're going to hear me do a radio show. Right. And, um, and I thought, and I never, I never heard from anybody or I never, nothing ever happened. But then, um, but then a guy named John Brousseau left and he told me, he said, Mark, I heard you do a radio show when I was at the base. And I thought, no way. He said, yeah. I, uh, I was driving or some, I don't remember how, what it was. He had an iPad or it was on the car radio. Somehow he was listening to KFI and he heard me do the radio show. And he said, you know, I was there at the base working directly for Dave doing stuff for him. And he said, I heard your show. And I thought that's pretty accurate. What he's talking about. <laughs> we, 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 we are the, what he's talking about. It's, and it would, it had actually gotten worse from when I was there in the early two thousands. In the five years that I had left, things were even more horrible yep. and the living conditions. And, and by that time, people had moved to the property. So there was no way for you to leave the property. In most cases, most staff were just there on the property and there was no way for them to ever leave. Yep. And, uh, and he was telling me the story. And then, of course, when you left, you told me the story about how you got, you and Becky heard the show as well. Oh, yeah. That was the Coast to Coast show, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you've ever read my book, uh, which if you haven't read it, I suggest you get a copy. It's called Ruthless Scientology, My Son, David Miscavige and Me. I described that escape that it took us six months to plan and execute. And if it hadn't been for that planning and if at the very last second I'd have been caught, I would still be there. I wouldn't be talking to you today, Mark. But uh, to get off that base, yeah, you literally had a escape you just couldn't say i want to get out of here especially me you know i'm the father of the chairman of the board and i'm 76 years old i'd still be there yeah. anyway they heard the coast to coast show and jason bennett come on and try to badmouth you at the end you remember that that's right and i didn't actually know who he was when the call was taking place because he had said he was my supervisor yeah. and i still had I still kind of had my my lingos locked into the Scientology lingos. I was like, supervisor. I don't ever remember a guy supervisor. And yeah. like it was your in the in in Scientology, the supervisor is the one who helps you get through courses in Scientology, not your boss. Right. And so 
And odd, and and ironically enough, that when I first wanted to leave in 1990, it was because Jason Benick said that I should be declared a suppressive person and yeah. that I was off post. And so he, so the same guy who tried to get me sent to the RPF and declared a suppressive person is now arguing 20 years later. Yeah. 20 years later, he's arguing, oh no, that place was a paradise. It was the best thing that, that ever happened to you. I used to be your boss. Don't you remember how awesome it was? I'm thinking yeah. to myself, who is this guy? And then yeah. by the time I figured it out, I was like, are you kidding me? Jason Benick? You're in the book, motherfucker. You try to get me declared a suppressive person. What are you talking about? It's a paradise. And yeah. uh, it was amazing. And um, and the, the 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 other kind of crazy thing was is that the guy that was the host, he's never had a problem with any of his equipment. Everything is always goes as planned. The night before our show, all his internet went out. His wow. phones didn't work. Everything just died. And the show was promoted. It was like, I'm going to be on with this guy at this time. And he did the show from his house. It's like a dial up. He dials into the show and, you know, and uh, he, and, and I got on the phone with him. He said, oh, we just figured all this stuff out. But uh, yeah, all our internet and phone lines just died with it. He, the entire time he lived at this house, never had a problem. An wow. hour before he's going to do a show with me. Oh, he goes, he goes, I know I've read your book, but. I, I don't really consider myself a paranoid person, but I might, I, I, I'm, part of me thinks those Scientologists might've cut my internet. <laughs> oh yeah. Was that Art Bell? That was, uh, his name was Ian Punnett. Okay, yeah. And, uh, and I actually ended up doing two different shows with him, but it was on the Coast to Coast AM show right. um, that, Art, that Art Bell traditionally did. And, and Ian was sort of a fill-in host um, right. for many years. And, uh, and he was a great guy. Um, I don't think he does radio anymore, but um, but he was a great he he was very knowledgeable, and I think he was actually. I want to say he was a minister. He actually was a minister, he so was, he was very knowledgeable. Yeah. yeah, he was, but he was very knowledgeable on a lot of aspects of life, though he was very studied yeah. person and uh, very great insight. I, I do. I heard the whole show, and uh, I I got in trouble for listening to it, and I told Becky about it as well. And I think you mentioned something about human rights on it. And then she mentioned to me, she said, well, we don't have any human rights. And somehow in a conversation with Mark Yeager, that came up. So then she had to go in for a security check because that she had mutual outroots with you. Meaning, and for our audience, that means that if somebody is has some agreements with somebody who's against the church, that would be called mutual out rudiments. And I think that's, I'll let it go with that. So I, I think you know what I'm yeah. talking about. Anyway, go on, yeah. Mark. Yeah. So to me, it, it was just amazing that, you know, and I, and of course I found this out years and years later that John Brousseau, who then eventually escaped, heard the show and that you and Becky, who also heard the show eventually escaped. So I thought, you know what, if I got three people, if I might, might've influenced them in some small way <laughs> that, um, and, and that, and that's another thing is a lot of times they say when people escape from the base they say oh that person's a drug addict now or that person's a bum on the street and that and I, it's like no no i know this guy in a bum on the street he did a radio show uh from from his house in burbank california he ain't a bum you know yeah. I mean, he's he's talking smack about you guys telling all the stories of this crazy place yeah so um but yeah so anyway i ended up starting in 2007 i ended up starting my own company and um, and we do audio visual uh, systems installations all over the United States, and we do a lot of work for museums and um, and private facilities and sort of uh, sort of this thing. A lot of interactives. We do giant touch wall, touch video walls, and giant touch tables. And um, and I work with oddly and crazily enough, I've done a lot of presidential museums. So wow. I worked on the Richard Nixon Museum. I worked on, I've worked on the JFK Museum, uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, we're doing work on some other museums of that, that nature. But when you're working with these people, um, they're really trying to, really trying to highlight the highs and lows of these people's careers uh, as, a, as a president. And they talk about the bad things. They talk about these guys. They did some stupid things. They did some great yeah. things. 
Yeah. They don't just try to sweep it under the rug. And it, and it really kind of opened my eyes because we did a lot of these systems for golden air for Scientology. And we always, and that Ellen Hubbard, he didn't even sneeze. He didn't, yeah. he never picked his nose. He didn't, he didn't uh, get a cut. He never got sick. He never, like, it, like he went through his entire life as this perful, perfect, immortal being. And, yeah. and the guy never, never said uh, the wrong thing once. And you realize, um, yeah, and there's no such person. Nope. No, no one's like that. Everybody's got, everybody's, everybody's human at the end of the day. And, um, and even these guys who they, you know, depending on your, your political stand or, you know, where you, which way you lean or whatever, we, we, we do museums for whoever needs a museum. So, but, but I, but I learned, I just through doing these museums, I've gotten quite an education because they're, they're, they're history museums and they're, audio visual interactives and so on and they have all these stories about um these people and i just wanted to tell this one funny story based that kind of shows my ignorance but also is kind of funny but we were doing the richard nixon library and they wanted to have like 12 interactives but they only had budget for 10 or 11 or whatever but they kept trying to squeeze this extra interactive and they just wanted us basically wanted us to do more work for the same amount of money yeah. And, um, and we're, we were having a conference or a meeting or something on the thing. And I, and I said, listen, we, if, if we're going to do 12, we just need a little bit more. Don't you guys have some sort of slush fund or something that you can pull this from? And everybody was just like, oh my God, you didn't just say that. Like he just said that. Is he crazy? And, uh, and the guy that I'm working with on the museum, he leans over to me, he goes, uh, Mark, uh, the term slush fund sort of came about from the Watergate scandal. That's where the slush fund came from. <laughs> so maybe not, not, maybe not the best choice of words to, yeah. to use in this exact moment. And, uh, and I thought, I thought to myself, okay, oh, slush. Oh, I get it. I get it. And like, and then I said, so you do have a slush fund, right? <laughs> anyway, funny. we, we did end up getting a little bit more money from, contingency <laughs> yeah no, but, it's, um, it's contingency but um yeah contingency but um but yeah it just kind of showed i i'm just i had no clue yeah. that 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 the the dots or how to connect that or anything but um but yeah even scientology at a point when we were in los angeles had sent private investigators to my clients that i'd done work for wow saying that they were they were uh, uh, participating in an investigation of one of the people that had worked for me, which was actually somebody who had escaped from Scientology. And I was trying to throw him a bone and, and give him some work because um, he literally had just left a week or two before. And I said, oh, you know, come work with me. I've I can. I, I got some stuff you can do. And as a result, they went around to all my clients and told them um, – Oh, we're investigating this kid that works for modes for the company. And, and anyway, it just never stopped. And only until really, I'd say until 2011, when we moved to Colorado, did it kind of start dying out in terms of the harassment, the, the, the overt harassment, they, they've still sent private investigators and they've taken pictures of our house and all this sort of thing. But in terms of having people following us 24 seven, only when we moved here did that sort of just die out. Yeah, and uh, and any harassment. I mean, when Leah Leah um, Leah Remini came and did a show, and she came here and shot at our house, and she shot at my my business here in Castle Rock, Colorado, and they had private investigators following her here when when she came here to Colorado. Yeah, and um, so I mean, they really they really don't have. I don't know of a line that they have that they won't cross in terms of destroying a family or trying to destroy somebody's livelihood or as long as they've got money to make and somebody standing in the way of that, they'll, they'll do whatever they need to do to uh, try and shut that person down. And, um, and that's why for me, when I left, I, I noticed that when people, the ex int base people or ex C org members, when they met up and connected with each other, and started sharing stories, it set, it seemed to be a therapeutic uh, result. So when you share your story with somebody else and you realize, oh, I wasn't the one that was crazy. 
it was the place that was crazy. It had nothing yeah. to do with me. Yeah. And so you start, people start kind of waking up and people start coming out of their funk. Cause when you leave, you're sort of, you're broken. You're, you're That's mentally, broken. you're mentally unstable. And we, and I had nightmares and I had nightmares constantly when I first left of, of being dragged back. Yep. And even after I had kids, I had a nightmare that Dave took one of my kids in the store one day. Like I was in the store shopping and I saw him with one of my kids in a shopping cart run out of the store. Wow. Like crazy dreams, crazy yeah. wild oh, yeah. dreams. And, um, and when I wrote the book, I stopped having the dreams. Just, just getting it all out on, just, just talking about it and writing it all down, the, the nightmares stopped. So, and, um, and, and so then I encouraged other people who left. I said, you know what? You should write a book. I don't even care if you didn't have the same ex experience as me. Write a book. What was your experience? What was your viewpoint of the craziness? Yeah. And I'll tell you, Jeff Hawkins, Amy Scobie, yourself, Leah, all these people. When you read the books, you're like, yeah, this is the same. It's just the same stuff with just different people. It's, yeah. it's almost like um, we all watch the same movie. And we're yeah. all just writing a review of the movie from our own perspective, but it's the same stuff. Yeah. Families being torn apart, steal, taking people's money for nothing, uh, abuse, uh, kids that have no place running anything in charge of these big organizations. And yeah. I mean, I remember when you guys, when they'd have these little messengers from CMO Gold coming down and yelling at you guys, you got you have a you have a, a guy who's writing music his whole life, even like Peter Schles or you. Yeah. You, Master musicians have some 12 year old kid who, who hasn't even picked up a, a recorder, much less a keyboard or a trumpet yelling at you guys that you aren't done with the, the score or the mix or the, or the recording. And just, you think you're just thinking to yourself, is this a real thing? Like, is there really a 12 year old yelling at this old guy that yeah. is like, is a pro at what he does? Forget 10,000 hours. Shoot. We put in 10,000 hours in a few years. Yeah. We, we're in the hundreds of thousands of hours we've been doing this. We're not only a genius or a pro at this. We, we, you, could, you could say that about a lot of the people there. They've done it so many hours. They, yeah. they're, they could do it in their sleep. And in many cases, we did. <laughs> yeah, we did it in our goddamn sleep. But yeah. You mentioned the term earlier on uh, in this interview, or maybe it was on the prior episode I had you on about an alternate reality. And that's what we're talking about here, because this reality of somebody who's 12 and 13 and 15 years old dishing out orders to a professional person who's done it their whole life, who has statistics in it. Like in my case, you know, I had my own album released by Polydor Records in England. I got a writer's contract with Chapels Publishing. Uh, I was asked to play on BBC. That's what you consider a statistic. OK, and these people coming around and saying, why aren't you done with this? You know, this is this is some reality that exists in their mind, but not in the physical universe. It's just, it's Looney Tunes. And they had that, not only did they have it for music, it was across the board. Yeah, so I know. Film production, video editing, um, uh, print publications. It, you just had people that had no qualifications or no experience managing and running and in most cases yelling at or shoving or punching or kicking yep. seasoned professionals that had done this their whole lives and, and in some cases was the only reason that they worked in the sea org or worked at golden era productions they were targeted we need somebody who is this person to come here and do this function here for us yep because he knows what he's doing and then you have kids that are just running around yelling at these people. And yeah. that, and that's not a, that wasn't like a isolated instance. That's actually sort of how the, the Commodore's messenger org was originated. And that was sort of the tradition. We want small kids because yeah. they're the ones that can be molded into the, these fire breathing product officers, these people that are going to yell at these people to get the work done. And even when you hear about like Janice who wrote a book, Janice Grady, um, she wrote a book about how she was a messenger, Commodore's messenger with L. Ron Hubbard. Yep. She was a kid. She was a little kid. Yeah, and she grew up and then ended up working at the Ant Base as well. And so 
yeah, it is. It you're right. It is an alternate reality. And and I find a lot of people when they hear these stories, they think there's just no way. There's yeah. just no, it's just how can a modern day prison camp be located two hours east of Los Angeles? Like that doesn't make any sense. There's in in no world does that take place. And then you see, there's like when I released my book in 2009. Mine was the only book for, about the Ent base from somebody who worked there. Well, it's 2018 now. I think there's like 15 of them now. Yeah. I mean, there's a ton of books out there. And somebody you know? told me there's 30 books, not not only um, X Ent base, but there's I think a total of 30 books between like Janet Reitman and Leah and yourself and and all these people who've written books about Scientology. There's 30 now. And you know, it's amazing. Yeah. Mark, I'll tell you, maybe I should have called this program Twilight Zone. And right. it would be more a little more descriptive of what happens here because you're right when you say that many people say, Are you kidding? You actually put up with that? You have to experience it to see the mindset you're in and know why people can stay there all these years. And I think you're the one who said years ago, if they took a bus drove it onto the base and said, look, get on this bus. We'll give you a job. We'll give you money. We'll give you a marketable skill. I don't know if anybody would get on that bus. And I, if you were the one that said it, I happen to agree with you, Mark. I, I did because when we were working with the FBI who was investigating them for human trafficking and they were like, we're just going to pull in there. We're going to rescue these people. And yeah. I told them, I'm like, these people don't even know they need to be rescued. They yeah. think they think they're saving the planet. They think they're saving the universe yeah. from 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 the the psychiatrists and the drug companies and they and it's just they have no idea that they're in a bubble and they don't know what's happening in the real world yeah. and they think and they really do think that people are eating dinner talking about Scientology and how awesome it is like they think families are sitting at the dinner table going like that Tom Cruise is really a dedicated Scientologist so oh, it's amazing yeah. you know like no, no, they're joking about these guys. They're not yeah. talking about them in a good way. Well, so I mean, it's, it's, it's sad. Is, yeah, they, the truth is they have been brainwashed in the true sense of the term. Okay. So, Mark, let me ask you, do you think you've told your story now? I don't want to cut you off if you have more to say, but I think we Oh, no. I think we covered. I think between the last interview and this interview, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, the book obviously goes into a lot more detail, but um, uh, the audio book, I just, I just read it. So I'm really fresh on what's in the book, but I think the audio book, I want to say it's around 12 hours. So if you get it, you could, you could listen to it in a, in a week uh, to and from work. You could, uh, you can get through the book and, uh, and I try to stay true to the, to my writings with the, the way the book is written. I tried to narrate it. I did the narration myself. And, uh, and even when I did Muriel, when, what, what happened to Mark? I do just like that. Yeah. What happened to Mark? Um, um, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, no, I think, uh, I think this was good. I hope, uh, you get some people to watch it. And, um, and I also want to say, I just want to let everybody know this, that when Ron first left and he wasn't really public, I told him, I said, dude, you know, you got a book in you, right? Come on. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Don't get be shy. Right. Yeah. Get, to, get right. to writing. When you decide, if you already written the book, then when you decide you want to release it, you already have it written. But um, but you were like, I don't know. I don't want to cause any trouble. I don't <laughs> want to make any waves. I said, I was there, but I was there. I was in the same spot. I remember that. <laughs> I know. And the truth of the matter is, I do want to make waves. That's why I have this program. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Mark, I really appreciate awesome. you coming on. And uh, it's been wonderful talking to you and you know you airing your story for our listeners and uh it, it, people listening to this you, you got to listen to what he said and accept it as a truth because it is the truth and he's doing the best he can to make sure people don't go into scientology and get their lives ruined and those of you who are listening i encourage you to become a patreon you can look this up on my website the real .com. your help is appreciated and I really appreciate you, Mark, for taking the time to do this. Okay, buddy? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And I'll, uh, I'll see you next time. Yep. And I am Ron Miscavige. This is Life After Scientology. See you on the next episode.